The views and opinions expressed on the following program are not necessarily those of the staff and management of Salem Media of Hawaii. Welcome to Generations Radio, where the focus is on our seniors and their families. We are here each Saturday afternoon from 5 until 6 p.m., bringing you resourceful information with our radio team of professionals in the field of aging. Stay with us for the next one hour as we explore different ways to make life more exciting and meaningful for our extraordinary seniors. Right here on AM 690, The Answer. And now, here is our host and the publisher of Generations Magazine, Percy Ihara. Okay, well, and welcome back to Generations Radio. I am Percy Ihara, your host here every Saturday from 5 to 6, Sunday from 3 to 4, here on AM 690. And for those of you that don't know, we changed the state. I didn't change it. The station actually changed the name of this, um, uh, this I guess what, station to, besides AM 690, it's called The Answer. It was something else before. The question? I don't know what it was called before. But they changed it about a year and a half ago to The Answer. So it's great for us because that's what we do. We provide resources, as you guys know. And please go to our website, generations808.com. A lot of great information there. Just click on the resources tab or go to the search bar and do this. You can, you can click on Medicare. And all the Medicare articles we ever did is there. Kukua Mau, uh, our hospice and palliative care um, nonprofit is on there. We've done stories with them. Or click on Social Security um, or Medicaid. You see them there. And also, don't forget, you can go to our Facebook page, Generations Magazine, or our YouTube channel. Like us and follow us because we will post all these radio shows on our YouTube channel and eventually on our website. So thank you very much for joining. If you're listening to us uh, this Saturday, great. If not, uh, go to our website or YouTube channel, like I said. I know a lot of you do that, and I know a lot of you are baby boomers looking for information for their parents. So, And, and, I, and I really like that because, I, unfortunately, I went to a funeral of one of my classmates last week, and a, after the funeral, after we had lunch, we started sitting down around with my MPI classmates, and we started talking about our families, talking about our parents. And it's really important because it happened in my own personal life where people didn't start kind of having that conversation. And, and so today we brought uh, a, a beautiful lady from the East Coast, all the way from Washington, D.C., along with Hope, um, Hope Young from Kukua Mau. Uh, Hope, first of all, why don't you explain what Kukua Mau is here in Hawaii and what you folks do? So thanks for having us, Percy. Um, Kokua Mau is a hospice and palliative care organization that is focused on giving resources to the public and helping to kind of not, we're here to give you as many resources at end of life care, advanced care planning, post education and awareness about things that are available to the public. And all of our information is free on our website at kokuamau.org. So you can actually get an advanced care directive. No money to a lawyer. It's free. Two witnesses using a notary, and it's a legal document. And you guys do workshops. Can I say that? We do. We actually have a speaker's <laughs> bureau. Yes. So if you have an organization out there that needs a speaker or you would like to have us come out and talk about end-of-life care and options and advanced care planning, we are more than happy to come out and do that. Yeah, some is, is, I mean, I know people say it's our ethnic background or Asian community, whatever. I think you see it in the South as well. Nobody really talks, likes to talk about it, about end-of-life. Because it's bachi. Well, for for our mainland <laughs> guests here, bachi. I actually just taught my son this. Uh, what the word bachi means? Have you heard about that, Kate? What no. you want to explain what that means? So bachi is like bad luck. Yeah. So a lot of people, you know, a lot of people they don't want to talk about the inevitable, but it's going to happen to all of us sometime or another. So I will tell you, having been around the country, there's a lot of people who think it's bad luck and don't yeah, want to talk about it, it, and that's actually yeah. like it affects a lot of people yeah. that way. So anyway, I want to introduce. Um, Kate DiBartolo from Washington, D.C., and actually she represents um, the Conversation Project, which leads a perfect lead in, Kate. So welcome to the islands. I know you've been here. You said you've been here many times. Yep. Um, so can you explain the, who the Conversation Project is and what do you do over there? Sure. So the Conversation Project is a large national public engagement initiative to be sure that everybody's wishes for care at the end of life are both expressed and respected. So how do we get the general public talking more with their loved ones around the kitchen table before there's a crisis so that it's not all in doctor's offices or the ICU. Um, so we were founded up in the Boston area. Ellen Goodman, uh, yeah. who's a Pulitzer Prize winning columnist from the Boston Globe, kind of based on her own experience caring for her mom. What year was that, by the way? Oh, 89? 86? 
we were started about five years ago. Oh, five years ago. Oh, yeah, okay. the conversation project was. We live within the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, and that's oh, okay. kind of like a longer organization. But Ellen's experience caring for her mom, where they had talked about so many things in life, but not this. Yes. And her mom had such advanced dementia that she couldn't talk to her, and she was faced with such a cascading number of questions and, sure. and didn't feel like she could answer them. And so she talked to some friends. There was a real sense from people that all death can be really sad, but how hard it is afterwards and yes. how complex that grief is yes. afterwards really seemed to fall down on if loved ones had talked about this or known what mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. family members wanted. So that's how the conversation project got started. Yeah. Now, the conversation project is about before you pass away, right? It doesn't cover the grief afterwards, does it? Right. <clears throat> Although we do find that depression rates and kind of that grieving afterwards really plummet for families or people who have had these conversations. So we're focused on how do we get loved ones, not only family members, but friends and families and colleagues to be talking about this before. So we make some tools available to people that way. Yeah, it's very, very, very interesting that, um, you know, for Hawaii being a family state, you would think the family talks about it, but it's actually just the opposite. Yeah. And whether you want to say it's Asian or ethnic part of life or part of our, our upbringing or bachi or whatever you want to call it, 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 it it's it, you know, in experience, my own family uh, and my aunties and uncles and relatives, it's it's ama it still amazes me why it doesn't happen. Yeah. And is, is there a is there a generic reason why people don't talk about it, or they just think it's bad luck? I think, oh. you know, it's always too soon until it's too late. People feel like, oh, we can put that off. She's not that sick yet. We've got time. And it kind of keeps getting pushed off because it's not a fun thing to talk about, although we are finding when people do it that it can be far more loving and good for relationships. But it feels mm -hmm. people don't feel prepared to do it. And so that's what we're trying to do is kind of make tools available to people so you could go through a starter kit or you know think about what your values are, not have it be a really medical conversation. I mm -hmm. think some people think – they have to know all the medical things or all the legal things, and we're trying to move it more upstream from that. Yeah, I, it's very true. I think people think it's difficult. And, you know, I was reading an article. I'm very involved in aging in place and from a financial point of view, besides the magazine. And um, we're, we're talking about even, like, financing long-term care. People think it's very complex. It's really not. It's very simple. you got a few options to choose from, but you need to understand that. But you're, I mean... It's like telling me, personally, go fix your motorcycle. Well, I don't have a motorcycle, but go yeah. fix the motorcycle. I don't know how to fix the motorcycle. Right. It's the same thing, isn't it? Don't you think? I think it very really much don't feels know that what way. To say. Yeah. In fact, I was reading a really good article. I mean, I should give it to you. It was an article about financial planners, the 10 things not to say to a grieving spouse. Yeah. And one of them is, don't say, how are you doing? Right. You think they're doing good? And she had this lady, um, the psychologist wrote this article. It was very interesting, I thought. Um, and, you know, because when you go to a funeral, they say, oh, I hope you're doing okay. Well, how can I help? Everybody says that. Yeah. It, it's just, they're so numb at that point. What other ways to um, express your grief or express your sorrow or sympathy? But really, how can you help that person? So um, for the conversation, that's why I love the name, the name, the conversation. It's really just a conversation. Yeah. So are you going to be doing some workshops here locally in Hawaii? or? Yeah, so I've actually now been here for the last week and a half, and oh. which is nice. I travel yeah. around the country for work, and as you were saying, my grandparents lived in Kailua for 40 years, wow. and I never got a work trip to Hawaii until now. Really? So oh. I hope you're spending some time with them. <laughs> Unfortunately, they're no longer with us. Oh, I'm but sorry. this was a good, which is actually one of the reasons why this topic is so important to me. I've got a big family, too, so on both sides of my family, lots of aunts and uncles and it's actually amazing with all of my grandparents' deaths how well all those siblings came together and were able to kind of put Nanny at the center, you know, and not have lots of bickering and fighting with each other. Um, and so since I've been here, we've met with tons of different types of groups. And um, we're meeting with some faith leaders. We've been meeting with healthcare leaders, people in the general public, um, and they – Kakua Mao has an amazing speakers bureau that uses a lot of our materials to do these mm -hmm. public sessions for people. Mm -hmm. So what is what what exactly are people what happens when you when you do a presentation to a, a group? How does that how does that conversation start or what kind of tools or tips do you give them? Yeah. So it's funny, you know, we're called the conversation project 
we probably should have been the conversations project. Like this is never going to be one conversation oh, yeah. you have that covers every single thing. But usually when we introduce this concept, it's to help build awareness, help people realize that we should all be doing this. If you're over 18, you should be doing some of your advanced care planning so that even if you're young and healthy, you're thinking about who would speak for you if something unexpected happened. And does that person know what your values are? And so we try to walk through, we have these free conversation starter kit tools that really focus on your values and not medical questions. You know, some people get intimidated by feeding tubes and CPR, but if you ask, you know, what matters most to you at the end of life, like fill in the blanks or on a scale of one to five, are you concerned about too much care or too little care? So we help people kind of think through some of those questions and then come up with a plan for who they're going to talk to. You know, I went to your website. It's very, what I like about it is it's very basic and easy to get around. But you have some great screens there. It says 90% of the people know it's, know it's important to have a conversation. But yeah. what is it, 30% actually you have Fewer do? than 30% have done it. So you think it's because they're, they don't want to talk about death and dying? Or what, what caused it? I mean, I still cannot fathom that. You know? I think that... As we said, it's not like a – well, let me back up. My friends will joke. I travel all over doing death and dying, so to speak, and they say that must be the most depressing job. All you do is go around and talk to people about dying, and I don't see it as that. It's so much more about how you want to live through the end of your life. And so some of it is just that positioning. People feel uncomfortable bringing it up. Yeah. They think, oh, if, I'm, if, if I bring this up to my mom, she's going to think – that I think she's sick and dying, or I don't want to worry my kids about this, so I'm just going to hold off. And they don't realize how much m more worrying can happen if you don't. Um, but, but we've really seen a big shift in the last five years or so of yeah. how much more people are open to thinking about this. And I think especially the baby boomer generation absolutely has seen They're kind of different their own parents. Yep. And I, I think the other reason is it's relatively new. Like medicine and science and technology is getting more advanced, and we didn't used to have this many options. You know, if you, like yeah. life. I, th I think baby boomers are, are the ones pushing the limit because doctors have actually have less time to spend with a patient, right? Yeah. And a lot of times, don't you see this as well, that doctors don't spend a time, but they really should, right, talking to their Yeah, client. well, a lot weren't trained to do this. Right. They're That's in the crazy. business of life and, right. you know, avoiding death at all chances, and so that can be hard. I think that, um, yeah, I think the baby boomer generation made some big differences. I see a, a big analogy to birth as well, that it was like this is a human experience, not just a medical experience. You know, giving birth used to be very medicalized here in the States. Yeah. And that people are saying the same thing is happening with death. This isn't just a medical thing. This is a human experience. You know, death rates holding steady at 100 percent, even if we don't want it to be. And how can we approach this with the same goals of kind of keeping your own values at the center and yeah. making decisions about that? Have you seen Hawaii, since you've been here for a week and a half now, have you seen Hawaii be different in their viewpoints of why they do or why they don't have the conversation? Or are we pretty, is it the same around the country? I think the answer is both. I think Hawaii is by far a more diverse state than a lot of other states. And so I don't see – there's kind of an acceptance of cultural differences here, mm -hmm. whereas in some other states it's kind of expected that everybody's going to behave exactly the same way. And I've been really pleased here how much providers get that, mm -hmm. that different families are going to respond differently. Um, I think there's a lot of kindness here and a lot of – you know, big families and wanting to take care of our loved ones and ourselves. There's also a lot of people who are here on their own who maybe feel like they don't have loved ones nearby. I know that was the problem for me, for my family at the end. My grandmother was 92 here wow. living on her own, and her nearest kid was 4,000 miles away. And so when she started to get in trouble, even if they got on a plane immediately, we needed to you know, we ended up moving over to the mainland at that point, but she had local friends and other families and clergy and it doesn't always just have to be family, but I think that Hawaii right. has that. And the health systems here seem really engaged on this topic, more well, so than say, on some other yeah. areas. Well, they say on Oahu, on, here on this island alone, we're only 20 minutes from hospital. That's why one of the reasons why they live longer. Yeah. And that's a fact. Yeah. Uh, they've done studies on that. But I think the Asian community is, is more, um, I guess, how would you say conservative in that sense, don't you think? Um, I noticed that. Uh, and then some of the older 
Asian community really there's there's so much respect that you would be eating that you wouldn't even think about talking to death about to your parent or grandparent right well and i think that one of the things that's important there is then how you approach it so we have different icebreakers for people and you don't say like hey mom i want to talk to you about your dying <laughs> you know like you have to figure out how you're going to introduce this but, how but do you do that but it can be a lot more about love and respect and wanting to honor you mm-hmm. and kind of whatever the cultural norms are really leaning into that um We've been working with clergy around the state as well to have them maybe help introduce the concept. Sometimes if it comes from a doctor, that can feel intimidating or if it comes from your kid. But if your clergy saying this is something we should all be doing and here's how our faith approaches it, that can help. Have they been receptive to 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 do that? Yeah. And we're we're planning and we've got this nationwide initiative of Conversation Sabbath, how congregations can preach or teach on the importance of a webinar or something. Yeah, well, we've got more coming up in August about that and into well, the fall. Well, you send it to us because, okay. you know, that's one thing with the magazine. Um, I also belong to an organization here, probably the largest organization of professionals in the aging field called Hawaii Pacific Gerontological Society, hpgs.org. Yeah. And we, we have a newsletter every month that we send out that has a lot of great resources and events and links. So that would be perfect. great because we actually have my pastor, Pastor Russell, writing for the magazine now. Wonderful. And I've never really asked him to do that, but I was something that see where he comes from. Yeah, I mean, every every clergy is different, but and we work with a um, gerontological society in Dallas that's been doing this as well really? and engaging a lot of clergy that way. And so this hmm. is good. We make these connections, but I think when bringing this up, you know, with with mom, there can be ways too of like if you've seen a movie or you read a book or there's a loved one. I just came back from the funeral of my friend and I realized I didn't know what you would want in this situation or you know again positioning it as if something unexpected happened what would you want me to be sure that I know about what your values are mm. um, I, I think that that's been way better received for some so, people. So how do we figure out what we want? Do we talk to our spouse or children or parents? How do we I mean is there like a do you guys have like a step-by-step procedure with a starter kit thing yeah. that tells us how to figure that out. Yeah, so we have starter kits that um, in lots of different languages, first of all. So I saw good. that, but when you come to Hawaii, when you go back I home, know, you're gonna know more. we're going to need a few more Filipino, which is Tagalog, we're going to need Locano. Yep. But you have, a, you have a good list there. We got a I good list. We just got Tongan. We were over in Hilo and oh. heard we got a Tongan. Um, so we've got starter kits. We've got one for families with somebody with Alzheimer's disease or other forms of dementia, one for parents of seriously ill kids, one for how you pick your healthcare agent. So we, we try to make these tools available. But if you're trying to figure out what you want, I think there's a lot of people who haven't thought about this before. So it's hard to even know where to begin. And we focus on values, like some open-ended questions mm-hmm. that help prompt people to think, you know, that idea of, Am I concerned about too much care or too little care? Do I want to know everything or would I, is ignorance bliss here? Do I want my family to do exactly what I say no matter what or what makes them feel comfortable? And people, mm-hmm. there's no right or wrong answer. I think that's a really key thing for people to understand that if you want really aggressive care, that's really important for your family or your loved ones to know. And if mm-hmm. you don't want that, that's equally important. Um, And I think the other thing that's really important for people is to think through what they would want right now. So it's hard to think of all these hypothetical scenarios that could play out. And when I first sat down with my husband after we got married, which people should do, you know, when we get married, if we have kids every decade, you know, you do this more than once. He answered every question as if he was 85 years old with (laughs) Alzheimer's in a nursing home. And I was like, we got time to get to that scenario. I need to know if something unexpected occurred, what should I know about you now? And again, you know, we see that when people have kids, their answers maybe change oh, as they get older, you know, and, and I think that's important for people to realize your answers can change. And it's another reason why we should be talking about it more regularly. We heard from one gentleman who'd originally, he was like 95 years old, had a lot of different conditions. He was ready to go. I don't want any additional measures taken. And he went to the doctor and he was suddenly like, Give me everything you got. And the doctor couldn't figure it out. Like, we've, we've been on the same page for years. What happened? And he said, I have a great grandbaby coming in three weeks, and I will do everything I can wow. to be here to meet that kid, and then we can go wow. back to the original plan. And I think that's what we mean by thinking about what your values are and what matters to you right now. That's a good point because if you haven't – like for me, if I didn't finish my bucket list, I say, 
Doc, I need another month to finish my bucket list. Yeah. You know? It's one of my favorite movies, by the way. If you get a chance, you got to watch that with um, yeah. uh, those two major actors. I um, can't remember the name of those two guys now. Um, I'll have to look it up. I'm sorry. Jack Nicholson. Jack Nicholson. Yes, Miss Lee, our, our young uh, engineer here. Jack Nicholson. And what was the other guy's name? Um, the black guy. Anyway, Friedman. you get a chance. Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman, yeah. Because yeah, I talk to seniors a lot. And, and, you know, I see a lot of locals just sitting down being couch potatoes. And, and, I, and I tell people, you know, you're 60 or 70 years old. You still have a lot of life to, life to live. Yeah. And it's really important. But do you see any different challenges that, you know, you do? You, that's what your job is, really, to go out talk about this, how to get it out there. Are there certain challenges that you see? Or are you breaking down the walls as you walk through? Because you're, you're, yeah, you know, when I, when I, when I met Hope and talked about the conversation project, um, you're very happy. Yeah. You're, you're, you know, and you're right. People must think it must be depressing, but it's about life, isn't it? Yeah. It really is so much about how you want to live your life through the end. Um, we were talking to some clergy and some faith leaders who said, everybody in my congregation wants to get to heaven, but nobody wants to die to get there. <laughs> And so there's this little bit of like, this is one of the few things that we all share in common. Um, And I can see, you know, I care very much that uh, a patient receives the care that they want. But I also am really drawn to this work for the relief it can provide for families and loved ones afterwards and kind of that grieving process that doesn't have to feel so tough. Um, You know, Percy, just to give you a... Here in Hawaii, everybody has burial plans. They've all got their plots. They've all got their not funeral not, arrangements. Not as much as you think. I'll well, be honest the with ones you. that I've come across, they're yeah. all they're yeah. all planned. They're like, I know what music to play. I know where I am. I've got two plots. I've got they've got it all planned about what to happen when it's all over and done with. But they haven't really had the discussion about what happens to get you there. Yeah, very true. I think that um, so some of the things that we've seen around the country with large and blended families in particular, how important oh, yeah, it is. Oh, yeah, I'll tell you. Yeah. Hap- that's happening now with some family friends of mine. Yeah, you got to tell. I think one of the important things is you don't just tell one person. So there was a woman I met. You know, I was telling you, I got, my dad was one of six. My mom was one of seven. All those siblings could get on board because they knew what their parents wanted. They talked about it with everybody. There was a woman I met who said, oh, my husband and I have done this, but I'm – his wife from a second marriage and he has three adult children and if they ever he's never told them and if i it's going to start world war three if something happens to him and i'm suddenly the decision maker and they didn't know that oh yeah and it could make life so much easier if he just says hey guys sue and i have talked this is what i want you know it doesn't have to be huge conversations with everybody but so we see that especially with big families we often talk about the seagull syndrome you know the kid who's local, who's caring for mom or dad, and they do the whole planning, yeah. and then the sibling from California swoops in, dumps on the whole plan, and <laughs> flies back out. And Oh, yeah. So that's huge. You see that a lot in Hawaii because a lot of times the kids go to the mainland for college and never yeah. come back, right? Right. And you know, in the Asian community, a lot of times it's the oldest male, and they come back and say, I'm in control here, and he goes, yeah. I, don't, they don't, I don't think so. Right. So I think that's a really big thing is – you know, talk to the family member who might be most open to this first, but then make sure that the others know that you've been doing this. Or here's who I picked as my healthcare agent. Um, we see that people need to be sure the agent who they pick to speak for them, if they can't speak for themselves, is able to honor those wishes. So there was a woman here in Hawaii who I met a couple of years ago who said that um, she was talking to her husband about what she wanted. And he said, honey, I can't do it. I will keep you plugged into every single machine. I will hold your hand for 20 years and just sit by your side. I, I can't make those decisions. So then she But they w- don't really have to make the decision. The medical director is supposed to make the decision already. Is the, is the proxy has to just adhere to whatever. Because you just said earlier, able to. It's not that. It's right. They have to. Right. But there again, this is where like if families come in and are fighting and doctors get worried about getting sued by somebody. And yeah. so it really makes it easier for the healthcare system to honor those wishes if people are on the same page. So her husband yeah. kind of went that way. So then she was like, eh, I don't think I want that. So she asked her son who was like, oh, mom, I got it. You don't want a single thing no matter what. I'll never let them do advanced measures. <laughs> and she's like, that's not what I said either because I'm pretty healthy and young now. And so then her daughter was like, I understand, 
you know, depending on your prognosis, and if you were in an accident, depending on how you recover, like, so she's like, okay, you win. So I think that sometimes we have to pay attention. It's not always going to be a spouse or it might not always be the oldest son, but who can best be your voice and kind of honor what your choices are. As long as they get it done before they get any cognitive issue, like Alzheimer's dementia, right? Right. I think it's, that's a great example of why it's always too soon until it's too late. Like we should be having these conversations early and upon any diagnosis, you know, make sure that we're talking about it. Yeah, we, uh, we're here with Kukua Mal, Ms. Hope Young, and also Kate DiBartolo from The Conversation Project. They're based out of Boston, but they have a really good website. It's theconversationproject.org. Yeah. And they have a lot of really good toolkits out there, starter kits. I, and, and I did some research on here. We're going to take a short break. Uh, we'll come back and talk more with Kate and Hope here. We're talking about end-of-life issues and the conversation project. So we'll be right back after this short break. We will be right back with Percy Ihara from Generations Radio. If you have any questions or want to be part of our discussion, give us a call at 296-5467. That's 296-5467. This is Generations Radio on AM 690, The Answer. Moon Physical Therapy is here to help you back to recovery. Moon Physical Therapy is located on Ward Avenue across from Sports Authority. Physician prescribed for motor vehicle accidents, workman's comp, or that body pain that comes from rushing to play without warming up. Also event cardiopulmonary rehabilitation with our one-on-one patient care. Moon's Aqua Therapy heated endless pool allows for low impact exercise with less pain on land. We will give you the right exercises to get you back to health. Ask your doctor to prescribe Moon Physical Therapy. Moon Physical Therapy. We achieve results. Aloha. This is Martha Clopin. And Al Harrington. Choosing the right Medicare plan not only saves you money, it also helps you avoid headaches and heartaches down the road. We want to remind everyone to listen to a Medicare moment with Martha. Sundays from 9.30 a.m. to 10 a.m. as we help answer important questions on Medicare so you can stay healthy, wealthy, and wise all year long. Call me at 543-2073. 543-2073. Oahu's newest senior living community, Ilima at Lehano, is now open in the heart of Kapolei. Within this beautiful new community, offering independent living, assisted living, and memory care, you will experience a feeling of ohana that provides a sense of community and peace of mind for our kupuna. A range of spacious apartment styles are available, from large studios to spacious one- and two-bedroom plans, most with a large private lanai. Be one of the first to call Ilima your home. Visit ilima at lehano.com. Or call 674-8022. Got Vegas on your mind? Get Vacations Hawaii on the line. Vacations Hawaii offers weekly four- and five-night Honolulu to Vegas packages, which include three meals daily from six ninety nine. dollars Stay at Hawaii's favorite casinos, California, Fremont, Main Street Station, and Orleans Hotel. Vacations Hawaii will get you there in comfort on deluxe wide-body 767 planes with complimentary in-flight hot meal service. Vacations Hawaii's frequent flyer program gives you future travel discounts and credits. So if you're ready to win big, call Vacations Hawaii at 591 591- 4777 or visit pointvacationshawaii.com. Today, more than ever, we local people are living longer than any other state in the union with more seniors, baby boomers, and caregivers. Generations Radio promotes the importance to be proactive as we all age. The radio team will focus on issues facing our seniors and their families, finding resources to navigate healthy aging along with financial, legal, and caregiving information. So join Percy E. Hauer from 5 until 6 each Saturday, right here on AM 690, The Answer. Focusing on the issues facing our seniors and their families today. Here's our Generations Radio host, Percy Ihara. Welcome back to Generations Radio. Um, as you guys know, the Generations magazine is out now on the cover is Mo'ili Ili Community Center, celebrating 115 years in Hawaii. Uh, and thanks to Nadine Nishi, uh, Nishioka, the executive director, for getting us together and getting the pictures done and the stories. They do really great work over there. And what's interesting, I didn't even know this, and I, because I'm pretty uh, astute to what's going on in the state and around the island, but they have an adult day center over there 
that can pick you up and drop you off to your house. Yeah, that's unreal. And it's like, it's pretty reasonable price. I can't remember what, 65, 70 bucks a day? That's awesome. And they pick you up and drop you off. Do they feed you too? Oh, they feed you. <laughs> wow, yeah. that's a good deal. They, are, they have room for maybe one or two. Um, as you know, coming people come and go. They can go by the week or the month or by the day. So it's on the second floor. And it's in the magazine, by the way. So if you want to know more about that, uh, check out the magazine or go online to generations808.com. But yeah. So the June, July features them as well as our big workshop. And I'm getting calls every day because it's been out about a month now. On August 19th, as you guys know, 830 to 230, we have the 11th annual Aging in Place workshop featuring six different rooms with workshops going on. And every hour we switch out. So we have 18 in the morning and we replay most of them in the afternoon. So thanks to all our sponsors. You'll see an ad in the newspaper probably around the first week of, week of August. Um, but please come and attend that because uh, we're going to get over 1,500 people there. It's a long day. Uh, bring a bento, box lunch. There's a Starbucks downstairs of the Alamon Hotel, so you can check them out there. But if you need something to eat or drink. But um, it's a very, very busy day. Come early, stay long, and enjoy all, this, all the speakers. We'll have over 70 exhibitors there. Um, so in, including state and federal and, and, and county um, nonprofits and programs out there. So check that out. Um, so anyway, we're here with Kate DiBartolo from the Conversation Project and Hope Young from Kukua Mao. Now, Kukua Mao is a local nonprofit organization of, of hospice and palliative care. Yes, we, right? we're like a network. So we work with all the different hospitals, doctors, a lot of social workers and nurses. We do training for professionals, but we also do training for um, groups. We've gone out to Alulike. We've had some great sessions there. Um, we just did the senior club the senior hui over in kaneohe oh yeah yeah about a hundred people there um we went out there two times and they're asking us to come out for one more time because it's yeah. such a it, it's such a really um important conversation to have and then we help them with planning everything yeah now now you said you have an event coming up is it an in-person event or is you it know, a, a webinar we have a lot of different events that we have at, with the senior groups most of them are kind of closed doors because they're groups that are already having their own um, sessions, but there was there is one that's going to be coming up for the Deaf Center, um, and it's going to be the open to the public. Center? Deaf Center, D E A F, hard of hearing. Ah. Yeah, so they're going to be having something for their community. Um, I will give you more information so you can put it on your website. Yeah, um, it's really important. Or you, do you have it on your website, kukuamal.org? That one is actually not. It's well, well it's, it's on the public. well, Maybe it's on it will August. Be it's on August twelfth. Um, they are still trying to find a venue for it. Oh, but it's going to be for deaf community and their family members. But how many people do you expect over there? You know, the the deaf community, they, they all hear about it and they all get involved. So it started with just five to six, and now they're telling me the numbers are up to about 20. So well, it know, could snowball. I think it's really important just to have the conversation started and just understand that whole process. We've had Ken Zeri from Hospice Hawaii on the show before a couple of times, and we'll probably have him on again. But... A lot of people need to know. So Kate DiBartolo from The Conversation Project, um, go to their website. Um, it's, it's really helpful. It's very, I like it's simple. It's got very direct information. Got a lot of slides there. But I think, Kate, you had mentioned about some other. Um, it's just like things that we're yeah, seeing. Yeah. What, what works and what things do you see out there? I think um, one thing that's been really important is to have this conversation with people of all different generations. So we've seen grandparents talking to grandkids or baby boomers talking to their parents and their kids. And so realizing that this is something we should all be doing after yeah. age 18. And to, that's one of our goals is to kind of normalize it. This is just part of regular adult life it really is. that you should all be doing. People need to think that way as well. Yeah. yeah. This Again, it's not just about death and dying. It's about you know, you've made every other major decision in your life. And why would you want to leave this up to somebody else to decide for you? Yeah. I think... Um, We've seen a lot of people think that they've done it, and they haven't. And so if you think you have an advanced health care directive, go find it and make sure it's up to date. And, you know, my mother-in-law was sharing that she had one from surgery 13 years ago and thinking that her doctor probably still had that on file. And so just making sure you kind of looked into yeah. where things stand. But I'm going to question. Do you see the difference between males and females? Yeah, I think, think women are far more willing to talk about this than men. Oh, yeah. And... Women often end up being the decision makers yeah. in their families That's for healthcare issues. Up. Yeah. So um, 
yeah, at a lot of the events, we get a lot more women than men. But many men, you know, feel like I've made all these decisions in my life. I want to be in charge. And so it's important for them to have their wishes known. I met a guy who told me, like, yeah, 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 my family knows exactly what I want. I'm going to have a big party on the beach, and then I'm going to swim to China, and if I don't make it, oh, well. And it was like, that's it? That's all you've told your family? <laughs> like, you should probably. But I think one of the big things we see, there's an interesting statistic that 70% of people say they want to die at home, and 70% are dying in hospitals or facilities. I was just going to talk about about that, because in Hawaii, we're actually on a, on a what is, at the, at the time I saw the statistic, we were the number two in the country of people dying in ER. Yeah. Not good. And I think, you know, again, I don't want to pass judgment on where somebody wants to die. That is totally up to an individual. Um, And what I care more about is that disconnect of what people say they want and what they're receiving. And so what I think is really important, again, and and I get a lot of people who come up to me after an event crying, saying, you know, my grandma, the only thing she wanted was to die at home. And her Alzheimer's got so bad that we couldn't do it. And I feel like I failed her on the one thing she asked. And so in order to avoid that, one thing that listeners can do or all of us can do is to think about what our values are about that. For my grandma, it was she wanted her cat. So we needed to find a facility where they allowed pets. Uh, For other people, it's that they want home cooking or they want their families to be able to stay there with them or they want the grandkids to be invited or like what is it about being home so to speak Mm -hmm. that matters most because then the family can organize around that and they can make sure that whatever environment you're in because we know that medically it's not always feasible to be home financially for some people i do a lot of work in new york city they got fifth floor walk-up apartments you can't keep grandma in the apartment you know so Given that that isn't always feasible, what do we need to know? And so that's why this idea of these conversations that help explain that. There was one woman I met who said, I hate having my sheets tucked in around my feet. (laughs) My loved ones need to know that because if they're trying to make me comfortable and they're tucking in my sheets all the time. Yeah, exactly. So just like what are the things that to her was the most important thing. I don't care what else you do. Don't tuck my feet in. Um, so I think that's important. And then we also see a lot around making sure that, you know, especially these large families, that there's not too much bullying going on. And there was a woman I met who said she was at an event. She did senior transportation services. So she was attending professionally to learn more about this for her clients. And she got up at lunch and she said, I owe my father a tremendous apology because just last night, you know, he's got all sorts of health care conditions and he wasn't doing well and he wouldn't go to the hospital. And my four siblings and I were laying it on so thick. We're calling him, texting him, showing up at the house. My son needs you as his grandfather. You know, really, really pushing him to go to the hospital. And she's like, I realize now he's trying to tell us something about what he wants. And we are not listening at all. We are kind of imposing ourselves on him. So I've already texted my siblings and we need to all get together and really find out from him what he wants. So I just think that, you know, there's that or there's people... Where it can really strengthen family ties. And I met a woman who said, oh, I don't want to be a burden. Do whatever you want. You can get rid of me, basically. And the daughter is saying, mom, we would love to care for you in our house. Or I would love to, you know, that would be an honor to care for you. And so they can really be loving conversations that bring families closer. And I think once people start testing the waters, some of those little icebreakers, they they can find that it can be really loving. Yeah, actually, my mom last year came to me and said, oh, we're gonna have a, we have to have a conversation, so we're going to get all the kids around at Christmas and have a conversation. We never did. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm sure we will, because actually, after I leave here, I'm going to go meet my sister who's in from the mainland. We're having a family reunion this next week. But I think it's something we, we all kind of, out of respect, know more they, more that what, what their end-of-life issues are. I'm going to give you a starter kit, and then you can bring that and, and talk should. through it. It doesn't have to be written. You know, it can be... Conversation, and if your mom finds that hard to do with all my the kids parents, at once, my parents or? Are pretty open. Yeah. Um, and and they've done a lot of planning already. They know what I do. They come to my workshops. Yep. Um, but still, yet it, it's 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 the in laws, it's the other children that I'm not really worried about. But they need they also need to be educated. I tell them all the time: you got to read the magazine, or you got to you got to listen to my radio show. Yeah. Because it happens. Uh, like I said, my, my, uh, unfortunately, my, my classmate Lance passed away last um, couple of weeks ago. He had a funeral last week, and um, it was difficult. Yeah. 
It's very difficult. It's such a gift, though. I mean, yeah. to know the wishes of the person who is dying. It gives you that roadmap for what's good, what's not good, what they need, what they want. And you walk away from the situation knowing that you did everything for them. Yeah. So what can our listeners do besides go to your website? Yeah, I Some think. Some basic things. Um, get talking. You know, <laughs> like you start the, uh, maybe I should back up. You, know, you could use our starter kit or if you don't feel that you need that, thinking about what you want. Um, kind of talking early and often and and bringing this up. I know I said I talked about it with my husband when we got married. And if we have kids, we're going to do it. And and I'm talking to many people. I'm talking to my in-laws and my husband's aunts and uncles and my aunts and uncles. And, like, if if you kind of get the bug on this, you can't shut up about it. Like, you just start talking about it. Oh, we'll stay away from Kate. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. They're like, oh, here she comes again. Well, you, you had talked about it. You had just recently spent some time with a financial services company. Yeah. What kind of things do you give tips to these financial advisors? Well, it's funny. My financial advisor sent me the conversation project <laughs> and an advanced directive in the mail, not knowing that I worked that. on this project. <laughs> and she was reaching out to all of her clients saying, y'all need to figure this out at home, not always in my office. You know, like it, This is important to think about. And that way, the goals that we pick for the kind of care that you want or the kind of life you want to lead will plan that way. Um, and so there's a lot of professional groups, state attorneys, financial advisors, who are realizing that their clients often come to them with it. It's really important for financial advisors, especially if they're wanting to maintain kind of different generations, going to the next generations yes, and staying important. with families. They might be some of the first people to notice uh, memory decline. You know, they have these relationships with people, and they are really yeah. in a unique position to bring it up that, again, isn't quite as intense as the doctor bringing it up right um so it, it's more kind of universal everybody no matter what your age is you should all be doing this so that's been really neat to see but is the conversation enough or do you have to really so the next step would be to document this with, yeah with, with a medical directive or a post yeah so um and hope you can probably share more about some yeah. of the state things i we often say we need people to express what their wishes are both spoken and in writing so one doesn't do much good without the other sometimes. Right. You you don't want an advanced health directive in a filing cabinet and nobody knows where it is. And you think you've oh, done yeah. your advanced care planning, which is another reason Put why I say. Put refrigerator door. Yeah, go find. Some guy I met stores his under the different corners of rugs in his house. <laughs> and his nephew knows which rug to go under. If I die here, if I have a heart attack here, yeah, exactly. there's my funeral plot on this corner. But so you need to talk about this with your loved ones so that if they're pulling out a piece of paper... And they're looking at it and they're like, oh, CPR, yes, no. Like there should be some context behind that. So having these conversations can be really helpful. And then having the documentation that picks who your healthcare agent would be if you can't speak for yourself, what your medical wishes would be. And then as somebody's approaching much later in the end of life, like those final six months, 12 months, then they'd have a pulse. But I don't know. I hope if you want yeah, to share more. The pulse is a medical directive. So it's actually something that's meant for people who are, you wouldn't be surprised if they pass in the next year. So you wouldn't need one. I wouldn't need a pulse. But everybody needs an advanced care directive over the age of 18. Um, and that's for the what, ha what if it happens now. Um, whereas the pulse is what happens later. So for the pulse, for those that, that don't know what a pulse is, it's a provider's order for life-sustaining treatment. Provider so, order of life. They change it from physician, right? Yes. So now they have um, <clears throat> APRNs are able to sign off on it too. So it's a provider's order for life-sustaining treatment, and it's basically giving EMS a guideline as to what you are expecting for your end-of-life situation. So CPR, no CPR, artificial nutrition, um, all the different things that could come up in an ER because of an emergency, they have a, a directive from a doctor that says, you've had the discussion, you know what you want, and these are the things that we should do. And who gives them the form? Does it, does it have to be filled out by the doctor or the, the nurse practitioner? Yeah, so it needs to be signed in order for it to be valid because it's, it's a medical order, so it's going mm. under somebody's license. Um, so they're getting it from doctor's offices. Usually your PCP, your primary care physician, would be the one to talk to. Um, if you have multiple doctors, like my mom has a cardiologist, a neurologist, and her and her PCP. So her pulse is signed by her PCP, but her cardiologist and her neurologist have both copies have of copies of it. Yeah. yeah. That's really, so 
who prints, prints it? It's like a yellow, green, or whatever. It's lime a green. Color. It's a green oh. paper, and anybody can print it up. Um, okay. It's actually valid if it's white, but EMS is trained to look for that right. bright green paper. Right, right, right. I think one of the key things. Like, that's for a fairly small subset of the population, right. but all of us, every listener, all of us in the room right now, I won't ask you if you have yours. I don't. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> that we can all have an advanced dying, healthcare Kate. directive. I'm yeah. one of you. You're going to be in that special. <laughs> Wait. You're going to be in that you're, special. You're going to go forever, right? <laughs> but I well, think. Well, I, I get you, but um, for some reason or another, um, my wife doesn't want to talk about it. Oh. So. Yeah. Well, you know, Ira Bayak, he has a saying that I have done my advance directive because I have a family. So, I mean, it's really important <clears throat> because... I've what? done everything else, life insurance, college fund, all the important things. Yeah. Well, but we no. can help you. Oh, that starter kit. You're going to no, go home. You're going to talk about it with everybody. One. I actually have one. Um, but I just, I just, get, just got a proof of long-term care insurance last week, by Good. the way. Uh, but yeah. Well, one thing maybe for you or for your listeners, sometimes a really good icebreaker can be like, I heard this program, yeah. and it made me realize that I okay, haven't okay, talked to you okay, about okay, this. Okay. Yeah, okay, okay good. good. See, this end, is why. I and just... In the next month or two. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm very busy. You know that, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's why it can be little conversations, even if it's just like, here's where the document no, I, is. I've thought about many times, uh, just just me and my wife have very hectic lifestyles. But yeah. no, it's very true. But we definitely is trying to stay as healthy as much as, much as possible. Yeah. But no, it's something on my bucket list. Well, my, not my bucket list, my... It's a good bucket list <laughs> bucket idea. List. I'm, I'm gonna, now I'm going to tell that story. This is no, your bucket list. Idea. I mean, I'm on, on my to-do list. Okay, person. Yeah. So you can even do it online, you know. Yeah. You can yeah, do it online. Um, it's, it's not that hard. Yeah. Well, we'll get him. Well, you we'll can update you. your listeners later. No, it will be. It. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I try to walk the talk as much as possible. That's why yeah. people for years say, you know, you better get your long-term care insurance. You know, yeah. you talk about that all the time. So and good. I, I You're working your way through that list. Yeah. So. I think that um, if listeners who do do this, it can also, another big thing, so you kind of get your own affairs in order, and yeah. you talk to your loved ones, and you tell all your neighbors. Um, we were over in Hilo this week, and somebody said uh, they were having a garage sale, and their neighbor came out with flyers because they were so excited about these conversations, I'm like, hand these out to everybody who comes to your garage sale. You know, once oh, yeah, that flip is switched, you can't stop talking about it with people or, or helping them realize it but if people want to mention it to colleagues if you're part of a congregation this whole idea that conversations happen you can bring it up with your clergy that they should be introducing it yeah i'll get our pastor russell out. to write something i mean every every clergy has different opinion about that and and we try to make it really easy for them we have sample sermons we've got you know really? video from the catholic you church sample and, sermons? yeah we're, really? we're doing a ton with hundreds of congregations around the wow. country so um I think well, we're going to have to have you on our webinar. Um, we cool. do it every last Thursday of the month, about eleven thirty to twelve forty-five Hawaii time. Great, but um, we're not doing one this week, unfortunately. But yeah, we'll have to get you get you back. So once they do this, um, where does the family go from there? Do they do they just do they have to continue the conversation, or do they say, "I'm done, I'm good"? <laughs> you know. If we do our job right and we get more people talking about this earlier and often, you're going to have to keep revisiting it, you know, maybe each decade at that point. Yeah. Or you're going on a big trip or there was a death in the family or a divorce. I mean, it's important to note my mom was joking that my dad, their divorce, but like my dad was still her decision maker. I'm like, oh, I should probably update that. And they actually get along very well. But you need to review your documents regularly and, and make sure you've updated things. Um, Do you need to give it to your attorney and your financial advisor as well? Yeah. So that's a great example that some people treat it as like a very precious document that gets put in a safety deposit box. Don't show anybody. Don't show anybody. <laughs> it's like, no, you should make 12 copies and every yes, kid should so, have a copy. Your yeah. doctor should have a copy. Your lawyer, you know, make it really easy for people to find this and then to make sure that it's updated and, and talk about it with... Um, with your loved ones. But yeah, decisions change. There was a, a couple I met who the, the lady was in labor in the elevator of the hospital. And her husband stopped her and said, if I have to pick between you and the baby, I'm picking you. And she was like, oh, this is intense. We probably should have talked about this <laughs> before this moment. And then they were, she was in labor with the second kid. And she stopped him and said, if you have to pick between me and the baby, I want you to pick the baby. Like now that we are parents and I now have that frame of reference... My, our wishes are different. And I know a lot of parents who say, 
you know, I would put up with a lot in order to stick around to be with my little kids now. And so just realizing that your life circumstances change. Yeah. And so this isn't a one and done thing. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, I, I was taught, I talk to seniors a lot. I've counseled thousands of families over the years and I, I've seen situation where there's only one child. Mm-hmm. In fact, my client just told me the other day, um, you know, I, I don't know if I can choose my, my son anymore. Um, or, or, I'm surprised how many people don't even talk to their kids anymore. Yeah. I mean, that's a society today. Well, it doesn't have to be a child. It doesn't even have to be a family member. It could be your best friend. It could be your clergy. It could be your neighbor who you've had relationships with for the last 45 years, and they know you just like like family. So you can pick any responsible adult to be that person well, to speak for If I choose my you. neighbor or my cousin, when my kid finds out, they're going to be a little upset. Well, that's why you have the conversation so that they can all understand where you're coming from and why your choice is who you choose. I think especially if there's kids off island or something to say, you know, I pick my neighbor. They're right here. We've been in touch. They know what I want. They're going to be sure that they're keeping you in the loop. They want your feedback. But I've really discussed what my wishes are. And I feel really confident that he or she can honor them. We see some congregations matching members of the congregation who don't have a natural agent so they can be it for each other and um again even if uh, it seems sacrilegious to say not to have the documents done but even just having these conversations makes it that much less likely that there's gonna be some big blow up or fight when the time comes so that's what we're really trying to avoid and it makes it a lot easier for healthcare system too if families have had these conversations and they're a little bit more prepared because you don't want the loudest person in the room to be the winner of how your care is provided oh, for yeah. you. Oh, yeah. I mean, so, you've seen it so many times. Yeah. Um, another statistic that's sad to say is that Hawaii is, was one of the lower end of the totem pole of people that use hospice services. Mm. And it's something that I, 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 I've been trying to get every organization to start using these services. Even my own family, we had a relative that didn't call hospice until like a week before he passed away. Yeah. And it just, and I, was, I was trying to tell him for the year that you need to do something, you need to do something. Because uh, well, luckily he lasted a year, but after that, uh, unfortunately he passed away. And it was very sad. It just, it, you know, here in Hawaii, we have this idea of what hospice is. And I think that's one of the things that need to kind of shift because hospice is a really wonderful, supportive organization that will oh, absolutely. provide the, it's like whole, whole person centered care. Um, you also get like a social worker, you have counselors, you have. Bereavement help afterwards. I mean, it's just a great opportunity to to kind of be more holistic about the the process of life. We well, just, that's why I like about a hospice, yeah. the, the bereavement side. Yeah. Our, our mutual friend, I had coffee with them recently, and still having a hard time. Mm. You know, we just saw Hospice of Hilo this week, which was just such a beautiful facility. You get to that idea where somebody says they want to die at home. It's like if they could see how amazing some of these facilities end up being or the care that they receive, I yeah. think they would um, be more comfortable. You know, sometimes hospice is like a four-letter word. It's like, oh. Oh, yeah. And, and clinicians don't want to bring it up. <clears throat> and I think that's something that we're – we have a flip side of this work of working with healthcare systems so that they can reliably receive, record, respect what a patient's wishes are. And one of the big things we want is for families to not be surprised – Sometimes families are surprised that the end was so close. They thought that treatment and curative things were still an option. And so I think there's also some more work that we can do to be sure that families understand the prognosis. Yeah. Well, I know where I'm going. Hospice Hawaii has opened up a hospice home oh, in Lanai. You ever been to Lanai? No, I Beautiful haven't. Beautiful island. That's where Bill Gates got married. And Ellison owns it now. But anyway, <laughs> uh, they have a great lodge over there. Uh, but yeah, they opened a new one. It's in a magazine, by the way. Anyway, Kate DiBartolo from the Pro- Conversation Project. We'll have to have you on and get you on our webinar. Hope Young from Kukua Mouth, thank you so much for bringing Kate. It was nice to see you at the Senior Summit last week. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, next thing, come by. Yeah, yeah. Get, when you this get is great. Tan and get you out of the yeah, water. Yeah, I know. Like <laughs> I've but, been in uh, office meetings all the whole time. <laughs> I know. And I appreciate you coming down. It's great talking to you. So, guys, I, 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 I will get mine done, by the way. Yay. All right. Um, we can mark I this I will definitely down. get mine done. But have the conversation with your loved ones, and uh, we'll see you next week. Everybody, thank you very much for tuning in. Don't forget, go to our website, generations808.com, or our YouTube channel, and like and follow our, our Generations Magazine channel. All right, everybody, thanks very much. Have a great weekend. Aloha and live well. Mm-hmm.